The challenge is to understand you know, whether we're living integrated or disintegrated lives. And the problem with disintegrated lives is that you end up burning yourself up or wearing yourself out or being pulled in a thousand different directions. And not only is that hard on you personally, you know, but it's impossible to kind of figure out how to do things. So many people say, Ken, how do I balance my life between my work and, my, and, and church and my family? And the answer is you don't. Balance is a compartmentalized question because that means I'm trying to balance my time between this compartment and that compartment. Really, is how do I prioritize my life? You know, and so that's the thing I want you to think about as we think about this idea of integration. And I want to move on with this integration because not only is this important to you in your personal life, but it's also important in understanding the business life and how to focus on business as an activity for, for each of us. Let me get to uh, turn the page here. Back uh, a little over 100 years ago, Max Weber, at the turn of the century actually, Max Weber was a sociologist and he, uh, he developed a very strong notion that, you know, through his work that uh, those who act morally and biblically in business are playing at a disadvantage. That was the view of the world. But when he got into this, he said, it's not like that. He said it's the idea of, of, of business. He looked at, first of all, he, he looked at re countries in Europe, he's European, and he said, uh, you know, certain countries are doing really, really well, and other countries are not doing so well. You know, and, and why is that? Because we have this strange notion, you know, about what the, the role of business and the disintegrated view. So he began to, uh, he began to think about this, and he learned, he realized that Protestant nations had adopted certain vocational values which came from their faith. And they brought their, they went to work and brought their piety to work. They brought their moral values to work. He said, whereas in Catholic nations, those people that were the bright people that were committed to their faith ended up in the church. That was where you needed to go. I mean, if you're gonna be a bright person and you're a Catholic nation, you took your values to church and you put them there. You didn't take them into your business world. You know, and as a result, Catholic nations, according to Max Weber, tended to do poorly, while Protestant nations tended to prosper. Well, the, the idea was the rage around 1900, and it became really uh, in, instilled in, in the thinking of folks, but over time, the intellectuals started to move away from it, and it's probably because it carried with it a moral imperative, you know, which was, I have a responsibility to God to live a certain way, and people weren't particularly interested as time went by and progressed, as people got better off, the, the view started to shift away from this kind of thinking. The, the idea, though, was that in a capitalistic society where you internalized values, you actually had a difference in, uh, in the results. You know, so long comes another man in 1993. His name is uh, Douglas North. He and a man named Fogel prepared a, a, an economic treatise called Institutions. Institutions, you know, something you probably never read, it's about this thick and very small print. But it was taken to the Nobel Committee and, if, and he won, they won, the prize, the Nobel Prize for Economics in that year for this thesis. And, and I'll tell you about the thesis in a minute, but I need to help you understand this prize. This is not like the Peace Prize where you can be you know, the Peace Prize went to Yasser Arafat. It went to other very, you know, for very strange things. It's a very political prize. Has nothing to do with peace, has more to do with politics. You know, in the, in the, in the scientific prizes, you actually have to prove your point. You can't, to, to your peers, you can't actually sort of put something out and expect the political issue to win the day. You had to prove it. For example, Einstein, came up with a theory of relativity, but he didn't win the prize for that. Another man later named Swannenberg won it in 1932 because he could prove the theory of relativity and Einstein couldn't. So, you know, understanding these are provable events. So what did, uh, what did he say? What did, uh, what did 
uh, Douglas North say. He said that where certain, exist, certain situations or certain cultural attributes existed, then nations tended to flourish. And what were those? Well, corporately, it was the rule of law. It was honesty. It was property rights. In, in individuals, it was, and, 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 and belief in each other. Uh, in, in the individual, it was honesty, fair play, uh, accountability, responsibility, commitment. You know, think about these values. These are the things that he said cause a nation to prosper. Well, where do those things come from? Every one of those attributes is biblical. It comes from the Bible. And when people like Max Weber's Protestants you know, practiced their faith at work, they began to impact the nation in a very, very significant way. And those nations began to flourish. Well, he proved this point beyond a shadow of a doubt that where those things are practiced, you see a flourishing of a nation. So let's take a look at some of these, these points more specifically. Once again, in the corporate side, you see this idea of trust, national trust. I trust you, you trust me. You know, think about this. I mean, you, uh, you know, you think nothing of picking up the phone, calling an organization that's probably outside your state, ordering something, you know, it's probably Amazon, and expecting it to show up tomorrow or the next day, right? I mean, you don't think much about it. It's a five-minute sort of thing. Well, that's not the case in countries which are in poverty and don't follow these kind of, this is, you know, kind of a, a trust commitment, whereas in a country like, uh, you know, a poor country, the, the example would be, let's say I want to buy a chicken. You know, so I go to the marketplace. You know, first of all, neither the vendor or I believe in the money because we don't trust the money. We don't think it's going to be worth anything. So we barter. Now, I'm going to sell you, I, you know, I'm trying to find a chicken. I don't trust you, so I'm taking a risk that this chicken is a good one. I keep looking until I find one that seems to, because I need to know something about chickens if I'm going to buy one. And once I get to the chicken, then I say, okay, I like this one. Now the other guy says, what do you have to trade me for? You can literally spend half a day ordering a single chicken. Whereas in this country, it takes five minutes to order a $1,000 item, you know, if you're, if you're spending that kind of money with a credit card. That's trust. That's corporate trust. And when that's gone, you have nothing. You have half a day to order single chicken. So that's the idea of trust. Rule of law, where it's required that people follow the law. You know, we, we, you know, and then finally, of course, the property rights. You know, and the Bible is very clear about both of these. You know, he gave the law to Moses. You know, he gave property rights to the children of Israel. They said, you know, and there are many places in the Bible where it says, don't move the ancient boundary stones. Well, that's, people like to spiritualize those things, and you know, certainly you can talk about you know, tradition and ancient boundaries, but the fact is a boundary stone was a limit on a piece of property, and that's what it was about. You know, yes, it has spiritual connotations as well, but the whole idea was that property has, you have a right to property. In countries, socialistic countries, countries where they don't follow these views, nobody has any profit, property rights. You know, then there's honesty and uh, the, the accountability and responsibility and trustworthiness. You know, things that are internalized to people, you know, so that you don't end up with uh, a situation that was, you know, a man once said that, if you believe that honesty is the best policy, you're a liar. You know, and, and, and what's the point? He says, because honesty should be the only policy, not the best policy, because if it's the best policy, when something better comes along, you'll pick it. You know, it has to be internalized, no matter what the cost. So Douglas North had made this, had proved this. I, I, call, I call these things spiritual capital. You know, the idea that this comes from the Bible, it's a spiritual thing. Business is spiritual. People say, well, you know, church is spiritual and, you know, your business stuff doesn't belong over here because it's not spiritual. Don't buy into that. You know, it's all spiritual. Everything's spiritual because we're spiritual beings. We're part of God, who God is. And the idea of spiritual capital requires trust and commitment. And, you know, the, in the example of the chicken, you know, where trust has to be a part of the system. You know, this is true, uh, and, and we need to uh, understand that we are 
uh, we're building this leg of an economic stool. Look, you all know uh, and you've heard of, um, you, you, you know about money. I mean, that's capital. That's money that's needed to start a business, and that's an important thing. We have capital markets in this country. You know about social capital. That is, you know, not only relationships, but it has to do with uh, an educational capital, which has to do, you know, the interaction of people and getting along. And if you wonder about social capital, just look at the Middle East. You know, you have, I mean, families don't even, the only people families trust in the Middle East are themselves, their immediate families. And beyond that, they don't trust each other. And beyond that, they don't trust other tribes. And that's what's happening in the Middle East. I mean, literally, it's genocide. Because if we don't kill you, you will kill us. You know, and it's tribal warfare that's going on. This is a total breakdown in what would be social capital. And then there's the educational capital, which is you know, having the knowledge, education to be able to do things. All of these are important. But I've come to the conclusion that the most important single issue is spiritual capital this fundamental base around which things have to be done. And without it, uh, you, you really, you're really in a tough situation. I mean, without a moral underpinning, you know, there was a, there's a group that, you know, that I have, ascri have been involved with, and they're concerned specifically about fiscal policy in this country. They're not interested in social policy, which deals with the things of, of the, the issues of uh, uh, abortion versus pro-life or issues of marriage. You know, and the point that I made to this person is they're saying, look, we don't care about those things. We're only interested in fiscal responsibility. And the concept of fiscal responsibility without the underpinning is simply like playing pool without a billiard table, without a pool table. I mean, it just cannot be done. There's no foundation underneath any of this. Because if there's no foundation, you know, why should I not cheat you? Why should I not do these things to you? If, for example, in, in a country like uh, Bangladesh, and I bring it up only because Yamas won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work with uh, what are, microloans. And you may be familiar with this. Actually, Bangladesh has provided more microloans, capital, to their people per capita than any country in the world. It's just amazing. Now, they don't have any spiritual capital. They don't even understand what that concept's about. People are just, you know, you just do whatever you need to do. Everybody carries, you know, their own little measuring cups because when you buy a measure from one person, you want to make sure it's the same as yours. You know, and there is no capital there. So how has it worked out for them? Well, it's a wonderful experiment. Over 30, now almost 40 years that they've been doing this in Gameen Bank in Bangladesh. The nation of Bangladesh has gone from uh, number 200 you know, in poverty, the 200 lowest, number 200, if you start with the top being the wealthiest countries to the bottom, to 177 over 30 years. I mean, practically nothing. Now, compare that to Korea. Korea in 1956 was the poorest country in the world. Korea is today 40% Christian and totally their view is integration of life. Everything is integrated. You know, how are they doing? Well, during that same period of time, they've gone from the poorest nation on earth, according to the United Nations, to number 12 worldwide economically. You know, how does this happen? You know, it has to do with spiritual capital. And how does it work? Well, spiritual capital is a little bit like a bank. You know, when you do something, when somebody comes to you and you operate in a relationship that is based on, I'm more concerned about you, and I, I, I want to make sure that what you get is right. And, and my objective, whether it costs me or doesn't cost me, is what's right. You know, and I want to be more erring on the side of, yeah, I'll take your word for it as opposed to my own. Because I might be, you know, foggy in the way things look, and I might have some issues with that. So I began to work with you. And, and individually, you have spiritual capital, which begins to build. So I begin to build a relationship with you, and you buy from me, and I buy, you know, and I sell to you, and I take care of you. And over time, this becomes a relationship where you pick up the phone, you don't even go and see him anymore, and say, hey, look, this is what I need. And, you know, you fully expect this is going to happen. You know, and, and this becomes this spiritual capital between a number of people, and that's why you see 
like the tribes getting together, saying they will trade with each other, but they won't trade with outsiders. And when they do, you can be sure they're going to cheat you. That's just the way it's done, because that's how you do things. So this, this relationship as an individual is critical. But it's also critical for industries. And let me give you an example of an industry that has totally destroyed its spiritual capital, and that's the used car business. You know, how many of you people are comfortable going to a used car place to buy a car? You have no idea what's wrong with it. You know, Carfax has now come up and other things like this, and people are trying to figure out a way to redo this whole thing because it's around selling you a lemon or selling you something that's on the lot at prices that are inappropriate because that's what you'll pay. You know, it's, and, and it's an industry that has really lost its spiritual capital. So you, you can build spiritual capital, but you can also lose it. Corporately, as a nation, you'll see this too. I mean, all you have to do is look around. You say, what, is the, what are countries doing? Are they trying to keep their people in or keep people out? You know, people are staying, people are trying to get out because the spiritual capital is gone. You know, they don't understand that, but that's what happens. When people are trying to get in because there is some modicum of spiritual capital left. For example, let me give you another example, and that is that uh, years ago, the, the law was, uh, you know, in terms of going public, when we went public, the cost for us was roughly three quarters of a million dollars. We had accounting to do. We had you know, legal requirements and so forth, and this is back in the 80s. You know, and it was a document that was, you know, about, you had a document this thick and you had a document that was about this thick. And you signed a few documents and it was over. Well, we now have Sarbanes-Oxley, which was added, you know, because people don't trust each other. So you sign away your life as a director of a company and you commit to saying, look, I know what's going on there no matter what's happening. And if something happens that's going wrong in the company you don't know about, it's your fault. And you're, you can go to jail for this. And the cost of the same public offering is not $750,000, it's roughly $5 million and going up. Well, that's because capital, spiritual capital of the country is going down. And we're, the way we try to solve these problems are with new laws, new regulations. And you know how that works. You know, the way it works is, okay, we got a new law, how we can get around it? You know, how do we, because the spiritual capital is missing. So you can deplete the account as well as you can create the account. And in the process, both this works for corporate, you know, countries as well as individuals, as well as businesses. So as you think about this integration and integrating our lives, we need to be thinking about this idea that our spiritual capital, how are we doing? What's our bank account look like? You know, you, you look at your financial statement every month. What's your spiritual financial statement look like? It's a really important part of all this. And why? why? Because once again, we live integrated lives. We are, we, let, me, let me try to talk a little bit about an example of how this works. There were, in 1100 AD, have 1180 AD, and this is a true story, by the way, there were two guys that were merchants, and they were in a small blackwater town, off, really off the beaten path of where economic development was taking place. It was a major city, I mean, 20,000 people, if you wish, but pretty sleepy. You had the, um, you had the, the, the people that lived upriver from the folks that were in the business world that were called the commoners that lived downriver. And you know what it means to live upriver versus downriver. Upriver, the water's a little cleaner. You know, downriver, it's not so clean. But the people that were upriver were the nobles of the country, and then you also had the, the priests and uh, you know, the, the leaders of the church. And they saw themselves as sacred, and their operations were sacred. The, the church was fighting for right, you know, and might was a part of right. And so they were totally allied with the noble people of the day, and they were fighting for this, um, uh, you know, for the good of the country. Meanwhile, down in the city, you had the commoners, and they saw these people as just they had to exist to provide certain things. And they were in poverty. I mean, I call them merchants, but these two men were very much, if you've ever been to a third world country, 
and you've walked down a dirt road, you see on the side of the road, you'll see maybe a couple of cinder blocks. And on those cinder blocks, you'll see a piece of wood across the cinder block. And on that displaying sir, perhaps the fruits and vegetables that somebody's trying to sell. You know, and that's what this was like. But it was worse than that in those days because in those days, the law was you paid your debts. In other words, you couldn't borrow money, but if you owed anybody any money and you couldn't pay it off at the end of the day, you know, you went to jail. Well, this was for good because, you know, if you can't work, you can't pay your debt. If you can't pay your debt, you can't get out of prison. If you can't get out of prison, you can't work. And it was basically a system of total destruction for an individual. Uh, this is the environment. So in this environment, there were these two merchants. And somehow, they got their hands on the Word of God. And they said, you know, we want to be more like God. We, we, want, we, we really want to follow Him. What is it, Lord, that we need to change in our lives and what we do, no matter what is, show us where we're really not like you. And they stumbled across, as God would have it, a proverb which says that God hates dishonest weights and measures. And by, by the way, that's in the Bible six or eight times. And he was thinking, they said, wow, that's really interesting. Because everybody cheated. And the way it worked was that the grocers were in one area, the, the haberdashers were in another, the, the skinners people and butchers were in another, the, the bakers were in another area, goldsmiths in another area, but they were all together. And they're all hawking their wares and they're all selling them at the same price. The problem is that the measures are different. You know, so for example, uh, imagine you're selling apples for penny a pound. Well, you're buying them from the country, bringing them in at probably that rate. And you're selling them for a penny a pound, but in order to make money, you're cheating on the weight of the, of the product. And so it's something short of that. So that's the environment they're in. And the, the, they're having to deal with people right next to them. So they said, you know, we, we cannot do these dishonest weights and measures anymore. We have to give them an honest weight and honest measure. And they looked at each other and they said, you know, I honestly don't trust myself because if I do this and it doesn't work, I go to prison. And you do too. I said, so here's, here's what we'll do. Let's agree, let's commit to each other that we are going to, uh, we're going to come over at any time and check each other's weights and measures just so that they're honest. These guys fully knew what the issue was. Are we going to really do this? Now, think about this for your own lives and your own business. You know, there are times when you think, well, you know, I mean, everybody else is doing it. What's wrong with that? What's well, not right before God? Well, but, but it, I'll go out of business if I don't do this. You know, those are kind of questions that come to us all the time. And since we tend to live our lives uh, in compartments, you know, we say, well, you know, church is over there, you know, I can go over there and I'll deal with them, and, and business is over here, and if I don't do this like everybody else, you know, we're going to be out of business. Then what do I do? But when you put it together and you say, this isn't mine, just as Vandermeer said, this is God's business, you know, and it's his. Just like the church is God's church. Now think about that because, it, you know, pastors are not immune to this. They have the same problem. They sit down and they say, well, you know, we, we're involved, I'm involved with an organization that is encouraging Christians to vote. And we're saying to people, look, in the church, We've done the studies, and we know that the truth is that roughly 50% of Christians vote, 50%. And in an off election like this fall, it's less than 25% vote. And we're saying to pastors, look, you need to tell your people that they have a responsibility to vote. Well, why is that? It's because Moses said, choose from among you men who are honest, who are disciplined, who are of spiritual strength, who are leaders that, can, that ma can manage the nation. Well, how are we doing there? You know, how are we doing relative to God's command to us? <laughs> Not very well. You know, I'll answer the question. You know, 
Hosea says that God, in Hosea chapter 8, verse 4, it says that God will hold you and me accountable for the princes we choose and the kings we appoint. Okay? I mean, so imagine you get to heaven and God says, see this paper? And we go, what's that? He says, it's your ballot. Really? Yeah, that's your ballot. He said, how'd you vote in this election? He says, well, no, I didn't vote because I didn't like any of the candidates. He says, that's right. You didn't take responsibility for picking and choosing. Okay, so I'm getting off the subject here, but the point was, when we go to pastors with this and we say, we don't ask you to do anything other than get your people to vote and encourage them to vote their biblical values, they say, well, I really don't want to do that. And why is that? Because when you get underneath it, it's, well, we might lose somebody in the church, and we can't afford to lose somebody. And the real question is, whose church is it anyway? It's the same question in business. Whose business is this anyway? Do we really believe God is able to show up? Do you believe that God has the power to do something? Well, these two men, crazy as they were, believed that God would somehow take care of them. Because remember, they're going to prison. Now think about this. They're going to go into the marketplace in the morning. They're going to put up their sign. says, apples, 1.2 cents a pound. And people, the buyers are going to come along and they're going to go, not only are they cheating us on the, va on the weights, but they're gouging us on the price. Why would I ever want to buy from them? Think about it. Why would you do that? I mean, this is so contrary to everything else that you're offering something that, you know, on the surface looks ridiculous. Well, their business began to grow. And they began to get, you know, do more. And they began to see greater and greater results. You know, and all of a sudden they were flourishing. You know, and the people around them said, you know, what are you doing? What, why, why are you succeeding? And, and, and we're not experiencing the same results. And they said, well, you know, we're, we're following God. <laughs> what do you mean? So, well, first of all, we started with this idea of weights and measures, but, you know, and we're using honest weights and measures. So, well, can we do what you do? Well, sure you can, but you have to allow us to come check your measures, and then we'll include you in our group. And over the years, they built up 144 rules around what were honest ways of doing business. Well, they all began to prosper. Soon the haberdashers came over and they said, what are you guys doing? Why are you guys doing so well? I mean, you, what are you doing, cheating the people on vegetables? Monopoly or something? He said, no, no, we're just, we're just being honest before God. And they said, well, can we do that? I said, yeah, start your own. This is, how, this is how it happens. This is what you do. And they began to do the same thing. And then the goldsmiths did the same thing. And the bakers came along and they said, hey, what are you guys doing? We don't understand this. And they said, we're, we're, um, we're being honest with the people. We're giving them their money's worth. And the bakers thought, that's a really interesting idea. We're going to do that too. We're going to start something. You know what? For every 12 they buy, we're going to put an extra one. We'll call it a baker's dozen. Now, you all have heard that term, but you probably never knew where it came from. Well, they put in 13. They put in one more when you bought 12, just so you would not be cheated. Well, that little town went from 20,000 people in the next 20 years, which had been 20,000 for years. In the next 20 years, it went from 20,000 to 80,000 people. It began to prosper. Well, what is that town? That town is London. Let's take a look at it. Somewhere. I know it's going to work. See how... Is there anybody that can turn this thing? Oh, there we go. You know, and it wasn't about simply business. Their focus was on God. And look at this. I just want you to see, look, look at this. They created a beautiful logo. They called themselves the Worshipful Company of Drapers. And they had a logo, which was unto God only be honor and glory. Well, does that sound a little bit like what we've been talking about this morning? You know, let's take a look at another one. Oh, here we go. Yeah. This is the worshipful. This is the uh, worshipful company of grocers, yeah. and once again, God grant grace. Yeah. Well, you know, these organizations are 800 years old today. They're more than 800 years old, and 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 uh, 
they still exist. Admittedly, they're the oldest institutions yeah, in the world. Yeah. Admittedly, they've lost their way to some extent. They've kind of lost their focus in terms of what, what, is, what they should be doing. But they had such a huge impact. Let's take a look at the impact that they had when we, uh, in, in the years that they, from the time they started. The livery companies, as they're called, and by the way, you can look this up on the internet at uh, Google, if you like, and you'll see these companies still, and all of these things are up there for display. You know, it's not a question of did it happen or is it a story, but it's the truth, it's a reality. You know, they became deeply involved in the city life of London. In fact, the sheriffs and the Lord Mayors all came from these people. They, they began to change the nation, the, the, the way people began to govern. They were critical in the, the direction of the nation. As you know, you know, England then became one of the first, let's see if I can do this, one of the, it became the financial center of the world. You know, it was, it's amazing what has happened and the, since then other countries have built the same. You know, New York has been another major financial center. And once again, based on a Christian faith, which was brought over from there. You know, London spawned the concept of political freedom with with you know, writers like Hobbes, you know, uh, we also saw the, the understanding of economics. You know, we talk about Adam Smith, and I'm sure many of you have seen or heard about Adam Smith and the Invisible Hand, The Wealth of Nations was the name of the book. You know, it's actually five little vol volumes, and it took the world by storm. And he was talking about what he called the invisible hand. Well, what was the invisible hand? It's God. That's what he was talking about. He said, God gets involved in our business. He had no other way of explaining this. You know, we would call it today spiritual capital. And as spiritual capital begins to bud and take place in the nation, you see this kind of economic development. You know, the London also became the hub of missionary outreach. You know, William Carey from that period uh, began his ministry. You know, you saw others that came out of there. The first, the first mutual fund was developed out of London by a pastor. And the whole idea is that we are going to bring our money together, we're going to invest it as a group, and we're going to care for the poor. Barclays Bank was originally designed by two Christian men who were concerned about the poor of London, because in London at the time, you know, poor person couldn't buy a home because everybody knew that poor people were a bad risk. But these guys said, no, that's not the case. We know these people. There are some really great people who are very committed, hardworking, and we're going to help them. And they began collecting money from poor people to invest, and they gave them interest, and they provided mortgages and loans to people that had been living in landlords' rental houses paying exorbitant rates. They could literally live in their own home cheaper, but they had to have a mortgage to do that. And so they provided this. Well, today, Barclays Bank has lost its way, doesn't remember this history, its own history. You know, and I'm not, yeah, this is a case study. I'm not casting aspersions anywhere. But you know, about three years ago, they pulled out of the small loan business in Kenya because they couldn't figure out how to make it profitable. Completely gone from their original view of what was responsible. But it grew, it flourished because of this commitment that, got, you know, that was put in here. Because what happens with spiritual capital is when we begin to live like this, we become an incredible witness for God. We begin to show who He is in our lives. And this idea of witness is absolutely critical. You know, think about it. You know, as a Christian, God wants you to be an example, to be a light, to, be, to glorify Him in all that we do. And every transaction should be a witness to Christ. Why? Because the greatest transaction, business transaction that ever took place on the earth was Christ on the cross when he paid for your sins and mine. And every time we do a transaction, whether it's a financial transaction, a commitment between two people, you know, a commitment in a relationship, you know, whether it's written down or it's by word, you know, those should reflect the nature of Jesus Christ because that's what he's asked us to do. So like the, uh, like the two merchants, the world is really waiting to see what it's about. We lack leadership in this country. 
you know, you and you know, I'm not pointing at political figures at this point. What I'm talking about is in business. We lack leadership. There are very few people that can look and say, yeah, I want to follow him. I want to follow her. You know, and we are the people that can do that. This room is the place where that can take place. We're the people that uh, need to be read by those that don't read the scriptures. You know, there was a man that was passing out tracts, and there was an old guy that came up and he says, Sonny, he says, I can't read, but I'll tell you what, I'll follow your tracks, and we'll see where it leads. You see, that's where people are. They don't read the scripture. They're not into reading. They're not trying to learn this for themselves. They're looking at you. They're looking at me. And they want us to take what we have and show the world by our very action that we are committed to him. People say, well, what about failure? What if the business goes under because I'm being really responsible? and I'm really doing things the right way, and it fails. Well, then you've shown the world something really valuable, that you are committed no matter what. You know, but, but God is not in the business of failure. He's in the business of developing and prospering you, and I don't mean financially necessarily. I mean spiritually in every way. See, he has two objectives. One is to not only use you for his glory, for the purpose that he has for you, which he has designed for you, but he also wants to shape and mold you into the person that he needs you to be. And when you get to a point where if you've been really successful without having had this shaping and molding, you tend to think it's you, you know, rather than God. So I challenge you to not only take a life that's integrated, but begin to put this into your business lives in a way that shows everybody that walks in the door who you are and what you're about. My employees used to say to me, um, you, you, what happens if we get in trouble? You know, we do something wrong. And I said, that's your real opportunity to shine. That's the time when we can tell people how good we really are. Yeah, we made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes, but we are going to fix it. And when you're done, you're going to be happy. When we're done, you're going to be a happy camper. Because that's what we're about. That's what we want to do in our lives. That's what we want to do in our business. And as we do that, they stop and they say, well, why are you doing this for me? What a great opportunity to share. So when we integrate our lives, we begin to make a difference in the world and impact the world around us. And thank you. I pray that, uh, let's, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, uh, we don't want to live disintegrated lives. We want to live integrated lives. We, we don't want to have multiple competing objectives in our lives. We don't want to lose our family if, and, or make a decision about losing a family or a loved one over a business decision. Father, uh, years ago, when I realized how much work it would take to start a company and how many hours I needed to devote, I said to you, Lord, um, you're going to have to run this place when I'm gone because I can't be here more than 40 hours a week. At first, I thought it was blasphemous, but I realized that you're a far better manager in business than I am, and you did. Lord, because you're just looking for people of faith who will follow you and trust in you. So, Lord God, I ask that you would help each one of us today to be more trustworthy and to be more trusting in what you are doing in our lives. Lord, come what may, that you have our best in mind. You said that I know my plans I have for you, for your good and for your welfare. Lord, you don't, when we ask for bread, give us a stone. Lord, you want to give us good things. And yet, in the process, we are supposed to learn. So, Father, help us to see the failures and the difficulties as a part of the process that you're taking us through to lead us to the place you want us to be. Father, take us, mold us, build us, create us in that person that you have in mind, that we might be in our businesses incredible witnesses for you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.